Hello everyone, my name is Naren and in this session let's talk about system design for Uber, Lyft, Ola or Grab kind of taxi aggregation services. Uber's technology may look simple but it is not. When a user requests a ride on the app, the driver arrives to their place to take them to the destination. But behind the scene there are tons of service which is supporting the trip, terabytes of data has been used for this particular trip. Like any other startups, Uber, when it started, they had a monolithic architecture. That means they had a backend service, they had a frontend that is an application and a database and a couple of real-time services only. This couldn't work uh, well when the Uber started to roll their service into different regions. Uh, initially, the design was something like they used Python. Uh, for the application servers, they use Python-based Celery framework for this uh, asynchronous task. They had PostgreSQL uh, to save the database. After 2014 and now, Uber's architecture has evolved into something like service-oriented architecture. Now, Uber won't just handle taxes, but instead it also handles food and cargo. Everything is built into one system. Now, the challenging thing for Uber or any cab aggregation platform is to meet the supply to the demand or demand to the supply. Uh, the main task for the backend of the Uber or any taxi aggregation platform is to serve the mobile traffic because without mobile phone it is pretty hard to run this service because everything works on GPS. Uh, the next thing is Uber's dispatch system acts like a real-time marketplace to match the rider to the cab. So that means it is clear that we need two different services in our architecture that is supply service and demand service. And here is the complete architecture for Uber or any taxi aggregation platform. Um, and you can see everything here. I have written all the major components over here. But instead of jumping right into uh, explaining each and every component, I'm going to concentrate much on this particular component over here that is called Disco or Dispatch Optimization. Let's talk about how this dispatch system works. Dispatch system works completely on map or location data. Uh, that means that we have to model our maps or location data properly. So now, since Earth is spherical, uh, it is pretty hard to do summarization and approximation just by using latitude and longitude data. And to solve this particular problem, what Uber uses is Google S2 library. What this library does is it takes the uh, spherical map data and it makes, it divides this data into tiny cells of about, say for example, one kilometer by one kilometer cells. So when we join all these cells, we get the complete map. So each cell is being given a unique ID. That way it is a lot easier now uh, to spread this data in the distributed system and store it easily. So whenever we want to access a particular cell, uh, if we know the ID, we can easily go to the server where that particular data is present. We can use consistent hashing, um, by based on the cell ID. Also, S2 library can easily give you the coverage for any given ship. Say for example, we want to draw a circle on the map and we want to figure out all the supply available inside that particular circle. What we need to do is use S2 library and give the radius to it. So it will automatically filter out all the cells which contribute to that particular circle. That way we know all the cell IDs, so now we can easily filter the data which we need and also which belong to that particular cell. That way we have the list of supply available in that particular, uh, in all the cells. Uh, that way we can filter out, we can calculate ETA, etc. So when we want to match a rider to the driver or even if you want to show uh, a number of cars which are available in your region, all we, we need to do is, uh, just the way I explained earlier, we need to uh, draw a circle of about 2 to 3 kilometer radius and uh, list out all the cabs available using Google S2 library. Then what we need to do is, uh, with the list of all the cabs available, we need to check for the ETA. How do we need to do is, uh, say for example, so, so we found, say with, with this particular 
circle of about 2 km radius say we found about um, one here one here one here one here and one here so these many caps we found out in in the nearby uh, in the 2 km radius so what we need to do is so we have to calculate ETA or, or the distance from the rider consider the rider is present here in this this way uh, the shortest distance we know obviously um, we can calculate something like Euclidean distance uh, but this won't accurately give you the ETA uh, the, because uh, you can't just uh, drive the cab from here to here directly but instead you have to go through the connected road system like this say if the road is something like this so the, the cab should be driven uh, using that road so we have to find the ETA or the distance um, which is connected by the road so that way we have to filter out all the ETA so when we do that maybe we might get 1.8 kilometer and this could be our 2.5 kilometer or 3 or 1 or something like that so now we know which cab is suitable or which are the cabs suitable for this particular rider in the same order we can send the notification to the driver and if the driver accepts and we can match the uh, rider to the driver enough of explanation now let's jump into the system design and understand all the components which are needed to understand dispatch optimization component okay so now you can see over here this is the supply that means the cabs are the supply and this is the demand where the user request for the ride so every four second once the cabs will be keep on sending the location data to the Kafka REST API and every call happens through the uh, web application firewall and then it hits the load balancer and it goes to Kafka and it keeps updating the uh, location uh, by pushing it to Kafka and then it is consumed to different uh, places and also a copy of um, location is also sent uh, to the uh, database and also to the dispatch optimization to keep the state machine uh, that means the latest uh, supplies location that is the latest location of the cab um, so here we need a web application firewall and uh, if you ask me the reason why it's pretty simple for the security purpose here we can block um, the request from the um, blocked IPs or we can block the request from the bots uh, or we can block the request from the uh, regions where the Uber is still not yet launched and then we obviously need a load balancer. A load balancer can be of uh, different types. That's the hardware load balancer or software load balancer. And also in the load balancer, we can have different layers of load balancer, say layer three, layer four, and layer seven. Layer three works based on the IP based load balancer, like all the IPv4 traffic go to this particular server, all the IPv6 traffic go to the different kind of server. Or in the layer 4, uh, what we can do is we can do by DNS based load balancing. And in the layer 7, it is application level load balancing. And the Kafka REST APIs will provide the endpoint to consume all the location data for every cap. Say, for example, we have thousands of caps running for a city, and that and every four seconds we are sending a location. That means that in four seconds, we'll be having thousand hits or thousand location point being sent here. And that data will be buffered and put it to Kafka. And then they were consumed to different components over here. And also a copy of it is saved in NoSQL when the ride is happening. And uh, latest location will be sent to Disco uh, to keep the state machine updated. Um, and also we have REST APIs and, and we'll talk about these components later. So the important component is WebSockets. And why do we need WebSockets? Uh, unless like uh, normal HTTP requests, WebSocket is really helpful in these kind of applications uh, because we need asynchronous uh, way of sending messages from client to the server and server to the client at any given point of the time. That means that we should have a um, connection established between um, uh, a cab application to the server or from the user to the server. Uh, what happens is web WebSockets uh, keeps a connection open to all of the uh, the applications, the Uber's Uber's application, 
and based on the changes happens uh, um, in the dispatch system or any component in the server, the data will be exchanged to and fro between the application and the server. So the 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 supply demand and the WebSocket component are mainly written in Node.js as Node.js is uh, really good in asynchronous messaging and small messaging and also it is event driven framework. So people these days are using Node.js for all these kind of requirements. Um, so now let's jump into understanding the dispatch optimization component. So let's see how the dispatch system works. At Uber, dispatch system is built using Node.js. Um, the advantage of using Node.js is asynchronous and event-driven framework. So the server can push the message or send the message to the application whenever it wants. Now the next question is, how do we scale these uh, servers? So this is the, the Disco component or dispatch optimization component. These are the different uh, servers or the services which runs. So how do we scale this? To scale this, um, uh, Uber uses something called Repop. It has two functionalities. First one is it does consistent hashing uh, to do the distribute to distribute the work between these servers. Um, so when we say consistent hashing, we know that it needs a ring kind of structure. Uh, if you don't know about consistent hashing, you can check uh, one more video which I have made about the consistent hashing. Uh, it works similarly. So. It uses consistent hashing to distribute the work between these workers and uh, it also uses RPC call to make call from one server to one more server um, at times and I will explain uh, in about few minutes uh, why do we need to make a call from server to server and uh, along with doing this it also uses something called swim protocol that is gossip protocol uh, which helps uh, every server knows uh, the other server's responsibility. So, for example, this server knows what, um, what is the responsibility of this server and what is the responsibility of this server. So, every server has a specific responsibility. Even though they all does the same work, uh, but the responsibility to compute for a specific location is uh, assigned to uh, each and every server. So, so now, uh, why do we need gossip protocol? So the advantage of gossip pro protocol is uh, we can easily add a server, we can easily um, r remove the server uh, in this ring. So that way when we add the server, uh, the responsibility is distributed to this server and uh, responsibility is uh, reduced for other servers. Uh, that way everyone also knows that uh, this guy is responsible for doing what work. Um, yep. Yeah. Now let's see uh, how in real time when a user plays a request to uh, for a cab or for a ride, how this function, this particular setup works. So if you, you know that WebSocket has a connection to the user and to the cabs, right? So when the user places a request for a ride, the request lands to the WebSocket and this WebSocket hands over the request to the demand service. Since the demand service knows the requirement of the cab uh, or a ride, say I need a mini car or a, I need a SUV or I need a sedan or something like that. Or maybe like I need one seat or if in case of pool, over pool, uh, I need two seats or I need a complete cab or something like that. So now the demand service uh, requests the supply that I need a cab of this kind uh, at this particular location. So what the supply service does is um, uh, it, it knows the location of the user. That means the cell ID of the user's location on a map. As I have already explained, Google S2 library gives uh, breaks the earth into tiny size, right? Like um, say we have map of some region like this, it breaks the uh, location into small, small cell. If the user is present here, that means that it knows the cell ID of that particular user. So, so the demand supplies the, uh, so gives the cell ID to the supply. So based on the ID, what it does is, it contacts um, one of the server in the ring uh, of the servers. Um, so in the consistent hashing, as you know, 
um, the work, uh, the responsibility is equally distributed. That means that, say, uh, we have about 10 cells uh, in total. Uh, hypothetically, it is millions of cells. And just to make the expansion simpler, I'm dividing it to 10 cells. With 10 cells, the responsibility will be something divided like 1, 2. Uh, the cell 1 and 2 will be handled by this guy. 3 and 4 here, 4, 5 and 6 here, 7 and 8 by this guy, and 9 and 10 by this guy. So, say consider the, the user is uh, requesting from the location cell 5, that means that the supply knows the 5 and hits the server and, and, and it requests the server here to find a cap for, for this guy, uh, for, for, the, for the rider. What this guy does is, so it um, figures out, it draws a circle in the map and figures out, say, it draws a circle around it and figures out all the cells which uh, is responsible, uh, uh, all the cells from which the caps can be figured out, okay? And then it makes a list of all the caps, refers to, uh, it makes a list of all the caps and then in that list it figures out the ETA for each and every cap using the MAPS ETA surveys and it sorts based on that. And with all this information, it gives back that information back to the supply service and the supply service using the WebSocket um, sends the request to uh, the first few caps which is very near to the user and as soon as the driver accepts, uh, the whoever accepts first and that particular cap will be assigned to the rider. Sometimes it might happen that for a particular request, a rider, say for the rider is at the fifth cell. Um, so the cells which we got is say, say four and say seven. In this case, there are different kind of cells available. So now what happens is the supply won't directly talk to um, um, each and every servers. What it does is it handles the request to one server, that is probably this guy, and then this server internally hands over the request to all the different uh, other servers which is responsible to compute uh, the, the or to figure out the caps, that is 4 and 7. So in that case what happens is a request will be placed here using RPC call and one more request will be placed using RPC call. So now once these guys figure out uh, the caps ETA and once this guy also figure out the caps ETA and also the same with this server they all respond back to the um, supply server service and the supply servers takes care uh, of uh, notifying the driver and matching um, the demand with the supply. Next we need to add more servers to the existing dispatch optimization ring pop here uh, the reason is to we need to handle uh, the traffic from the newly added city. So we need to add more servers to the um, ring pop. Say for example we have added here and we have added two different servers. Now the responsibility of these servers are unknown. What ring pop does is it knows the all newly added cell IDs from this component and it distributes the um, responsibility of newly added cells um, uh, to these new servers, that is probably cell number 11 and 12, you take care of it. Cell number 13 and 14, you take care of it. Same way it works when we take down the server, it reshuffles the IDs uh, or reassigns the responsibility of uh, the computation of particular cell to one of the uh, random server which is free. Now let's talk about geospatial design. As I have already explained, Google Heavy uses Google's S2 library to uh, break the map into different cells and uh, that has been used to easily locate the caps near to any particular rider's location. So that is the use of S2 libraries. So next about building maps or using maps in your application. Earlier Uber used to use Mapbox uh, because of the Google's pricing strategy and etc. But now Uber is uh, back to uh, Google's APIs and Maps. Now Uber heavily uses um, Google's Map uh, framework in which it uses to uh, uses Google Maps to show on app and also uses uh, Google's Maps APIs to calculate the ETA from point A to point B. That is um, 
pick a point to the destination point and it um, uh, uses Google's help to calculate the ETA. Earlier Uber used to do all its own. Uh, it used to repeatedly uh, trace the cabs movements, GPS points and builds the road network system uh, on its own. Um, and also it used to uh, use the um, real-time uh, speed and different information from the cab to calculate uh, the ETA also. But now Uber has moved on and it uses Google's library heavy. So the next thing is uh, preferred access point. So if you know uh, so many times, say for example, there is a big campus um, uh, in the city, say no matter um, how many times you book the cab from inside the campus, you always, uh, Uber always shows two prefer two or more uh, preferred access points. For example, this is the entry and this is the exit gate of the campus. Uh, usually Uber shows the preferred access point somewhere near to the entry exit. How did it learn? Um, it learns based on the repeatedly uh, Uber drivers or the cabs used to stop um, near the entry exit gates uh, because they can't enter into the campus. So that has been learned by Uber and so it automatically shows to the uh, customers that uh, we can only pick up from these two points, we can't enter into the campus. So these are called as preferred access point. Um, they use different algorithms and machine learning to keep automatically figure out these preferred access points. Now let's talk a little bit about how ETAs are calculated and why it is very important component of uh, Uber or any cab aggregation service. Say for example a user is requesting a cab uh, from this point. So the rider is requesting a cab from this point and the available cabs near the user is something like these three cabs, cab 1, cab 2 and cab 3. So now, when a user requests for a cab, the, the demand service requests supply to figure out cabs uh, for a rider. Now what this service does is, it tries to figure out all the cabs which are nearby to this particular, um, particular rider. So now it draws, draws the circle and then it figures out there are three cabs which are free to take the service. But um, what happens now is it calculates ETA from, um, from the riders to these cab by the road system and then it figures out the ETA for all the three different cabs. Uh, this always doesn't work because uh, these could uh, lead to uh, bigger ETAs. Say for example uh, an, one more cab which is about to finish a ride which is very near and the ride is the trip uh, is already happening. Um, so this is a better um, um, selection than any of these three cabs as this trip is about to complete in about a few minutes and this is much near to, nearer to the rider. So, um, so Uber what it does is it includes all the different um, uh, factors like U-turn cost, turn cost, the traffic condition and everything to calculate the ETA uh, and based on the different ETA Sometimes uh, not just idle cabs, um, sometimes the cabs which are already serving the trip also included um, for to serve a particular rider. Now let's talk about database. Earlier Uber used to use RDBMS that is Postgres SQL database for operations. Uh, they used to save uh, you know profile information, they used to save GPS points, everything in RDBMS. Uh, it couldn't scale as Uber um, rolled out service in different cities. Then they thought about a new NoSQL kind of database that is built on top of MySQL. Uh, is something called as schema-less. They, when they are building this database, uh, these were the points they consider. The first one is um, they, it should be horizontally, uh, horizontally scalable. That is, you can linearly add the capacities in different part of the cities into the network. Say in here you can see there are multiple nodes in different regions which are added and all together acts as one database that is schemaless. Um, so if you don't want to design you can either use Bigtable or Cassandra, MongoDB or any of that since they also behave the uh, same way. Uh, and also a different other consideration which they considered uh, while building schemaless was uh, the write and read availability. 
uh, as I have already mentioned to you that every four second ones the caps will be sending the GPS location to uh, the Kafka REST API and those points were sent to Kafka for different processing and also points were written to NoSQL for a record purpose and to figure out and also points are say, uh, sent to uh, state machines also, right? So the, it means that the, there is write heavy application and also when user requests for a cap, uh, all this uh, latest cap information is also fetched from the DB uh, to show to the customer on application. That means that there are tons of reads happening, there are tons of writes happening to this system. That means these systems should be uh, heavily writeable and readable system. And, um, and these systems should never give downtime because we haven't heard Uber downtime even for a minute, right? Because um, every, every minute people will be requesting caps, um, uh, people will be um, writing trips, etc. So we can't just say that we are doing some maintenance, now the database is not available. So the system should be like always available, no matter what you're doing. For example, you're adding nodes to the system, it should be available. You say, for example, you're taking a uh, backup of the storage, the system shouldn't go down. Uh, say, for example, you're adding indexes to the system, then also the, your system should be up and running. So no matter what you do to the system, the system should be always up. So that's these are the points they kept in mind while building schema-less um, that is built on top of MySQL. Uh, so what Uber does is when they roll out services in um, new uh, cities, they try to build the data center near to it to give the seamless service. Uh, if not, um, always the nearest look data center is selected and uh, the data will be served from those locations. Now let's talk about analytics. What is analytics? In simple words, it is making sense of the data which we have. Uber does that a lot because you need to understand about the customer, you need to understand the behaviors of the cab drivers. That's when you can optimize the system. That's when you can minimize the cost of operation and also make the uh, customer satisfaction uh, better. So now let's see what are the different tools which Uber uses or different frameworks which Uber uses to do a lot of different analytics. As I have already mentioned, there is tons of GPS data flowing into the system from drivers and also a lot of information coming in from which belongs to the customers. All this data is saved either in NoSQL or RDBMS or sometimes in HDFS. If we don't have, if we're not saving the data directly into HDFS, what we can do is we can do a dump of all the data which we have on the NoSQL and put it onto HDFS. And sometimes for the different kind of analysis, we might need the data in a real time. That can be consumed from the Kafka. Now let's talk about each and every components here. See, um, the Hadoop platform has a lot of analytical analytics uh, related tools which we can make use of to build analysis on the existing data. So we can take a constant dump of the data which we have in the database to HDFS and use tools like Hive and Pig query uh, tools to get the data which we want from the HDFS. Next, uh, the component maps or ETA components, what we can do is you consume the historical data along with the real-time data. We can really retrace the previous uh, maps data which we have and then we can build the new maps all together or we can improve the maps data which we have now. And also with the historical data and the real-time information which is coming from the cab like traffic situation, the speed at which the cab is driving, or the congestion and everything, we can use this data to compute ETA. The dispatch system here, when there is a request for a supply, what we what the, these servers here contacts these component to for ETA calculation. Now Google also uses something like simulated uh, artificial intelligence to calculate the ETA in accuracy and much uh, faster. So the next component is machine learning or fraud detection. There are different kind of frauds happening on the system, say payment fraud, incentive abuse, or usage of compromised account. 
So there are different algorithms that are used to detect payment fraud um, where people are using stolen credit cards to offer trips in discounted price on different forums. Uber is taking care of that also. And there is incentive abuse mostly done by the cab drivers. Uber offers extra dollars when they finish, say for example, 25 rides in a day. What Uber's, Uber driver does is they simulate the trip using fake GPS location apps and then they claim the uh, incentives do, by doing nothing or by doing uh, booking for a ride using another mobile phone of their own. What Uber does is to find out these kind of abusers, it uses historical trips uh, uh, attitude data and it retraces with the with the abused trips uh, altitude and and that way we can easily figure out that this particular wa trip was fake and uber warns the driver that if they keep continuing they will cancel their account and etc and the next thing is compromised account a uh, lot of times hackers using phishing techniques gets the username and password of the customers and they use it to withdraw the money in the wallet and sort of things. How does Uber tackles that? It uses the historical behavioral data of the customer, uh, like what what is the user, usual location from which they used to book, what is the usual destination and the country of booking and etc. Based on this kind of information, Uber also uses machine learning techniques to figure out the usage of compromised accounts. Apart from that, to do real-time uh, streaming distributed analysis, we can go with Spark or Storm um, framework to figure out the trending uh, trending things happening in the system. After analytics, the very important thing is login. Now we have pretty much complex system over here and since Uber uses service-oriented architecture, all of these components are different services. That means they run independent of other system. That means that if you want to track what's happening or if you want to debug what's happening in each and every service or the system, we need to have a strong logging mechanism. <clears throat> that means each loggers in each and every service, what we can do is we can keep forwarding all the log lines to one Kafka cluster and from there we can have a platform which is built on top of Elastic Log um, Search, Logstash and Kibana. So using Kibana we can build dashboards which shows the total errors which are occur, the system's health and etc. Not just Kibana, we can use Grafana also and there are a lot of different tools uh, available which can gather the logs from different system and show it in a beautiful dashboards. So now let's talk about how to handle total data center failure. Data center failure doesn't happen usually but when they happen it's very difficult to handle the situation. How does Uber handle this situation? What Uber has done is Uber has built a backup data center and that has all the components which we needed to run the show or to maintain the trips which is happening. What happens is in the backup data center, Uber never copies the existing data into the backup center. Now you might think without the data, how can the backup data center will help to handle that situation? Now what Uber has done is the very smart thing or the cool thing is the driver's app itself act as the data source at the event of a data center failure. Every time when there is a transaction or when there is a API calls happening between the driver's app and the data center, it also keeps track of what level of knowledge it knows or what level of data it has in the, in the driver's app with a state digest. Kind of unique idea you can think of. Say for example, this data center went down. The next time the app makes a call to this data center, it learns that this system is not available. Then the backup data center kicks in and this data center, uh, the, the application, driver application, the rider application is now talking to the backup data center. 
Now this data center doesn't have any of the information for the trips which are happening. In this situation, the backup, the APIs in the backup data center learns that uh, I don't know the state information or I don't know what's happening with the trip now. Using the state digest which is present in this, it gives out all the data to this backup data center from the driver's application. That way, backup data centers now have all the information which is needed to finish the trip which is happening um, right now. Now, when these things happen, the user or the driver will never know that there was a backup, there, there was a data center failure and there was a backup data center which is helping now to run the trip. Now, now that I think I have explained all the different components in the whole system, like Uber system design, um, most of this data was consumed from engineering.uber.com. I strongly suggest you to go through the Uber's blog and read each and every article because they gives you a lot of information about all the components over here, not just here. I couldn't cover a lot of information which is there in engineering.uber.com. It was, it was like full of knowledge. I suggest you to read the engineering.uber.com or um, I will leave a lot of links in the description of this video. Please go through the links to better understand the system. Because of the time limit, I'm not able to explain each and every component even to the depth, but you can always learn from internet. If you like this video, please subscribe and hit a like button and please comment and share with your friends. And I am always open for the suggestions or if there is any correction need to be done in the system design or any other videos, please contact me. Thank you.